Without order, nothing can exist, but without chaos, nothing can evolve. In our world, evolution is often seen as a force for good, driving species to adapt. But in the Elden Ring, evolution takes on a darker, more sinister role. Why does the game portray evolution as something controversial, perhaps even harmful concept? What can the feared omens and the formidable Crucible Knights tell us about the danger of unchecked changes? This video is part one of a two-part series discussing the unsettling ending of the Dunk Eater. Be sure to subscribe, so you don't miss the conclusion. Today's journey will be divided into four comprehensive sections, each delving deeper into this intricate topic. We will begin by outlining the basic mechanisms of evolution in natural world. Understanding this fundamental concept is essential to grasp how Elden Ring twists this principle into its narrative. Next. We explore the lore surrounding the Crucible, dissecting how it symbolizes the process of evolution within the game's universe and what it signifies for the inhabitants of the land between. In the third section, we'll delve into the lore of the Omens, examining how these beings exemplify the game's portrayal of random evolutionary changes and the consequences that arise from such mutations. The main topic. In this crucial section, we'll address the core question. Why is evolution depicted negatively in the Elden Ring? We'll analyze the implication of this portrayal and what it suggests about the broader themes of the game. Evolution is the process through which living organisms change and develop over millions of years. Often, we associate evolution with progress and beneficial changes. However, it's crucial to recognize that evolution is not inherently good. It's a neutral process, marked by both advantageous and detrimental changes. At the heart of evolution lies the concept of genetic variation, which arises from random mutation in the DNA of organism. These mutations are spontaneous and lack any direction or purpose, injecting a significant element of chaos into the genetic framework. For example, there is a small chance that a human could be born with six fingers. This occurrence is entirely random, it could happen to anyone. This randomness is fundamental, as it contributes to the vast diversity observed in the biological world. This illustrates the cardinal link between evolution and chaos. After all, it is fundamentally a game of chance. It's important to note that not all mutations confer benefits. In fact, many mutations are neutral and often they can be even harmful. Yet, occasionally, a mutation may provide an organism with a competitive edge in specific environment. This is when natural selection comes into play, acting as the primary mechanism driving evolution. Take giraffe, for example. A common misconception is that giraffes evolved long necks out of desire to reach higher leaves. In reality, Giraffes with shorter necks were just unable to retrieve food and diet. Those with longer necks survived and reproduced. This adaptation was not a conscious choice. Giraffes did not decide to grow longer necks. Screw that, perhaps some giraffes like their short necks. It is rather natural selection favored these with longer necks. Illustrating that evolution is not about conscious decision but about a trial, or rather, a series of trials where only the most adaptive survive. The Crucible is an enigmatic entity. Players who didn't pay enough attention to the lore probably didn't even realize that Crucible is a thing, yet its influence on the narrative landscape cannot be understated. Nearly every major faction in the lands between holds some tie to the Crucible, whether through direct connection like Godfrey, the Godskin and the Omens, or through more elusive links like Placidusax, Destined Death and Radagon. I will not uncover the whole lore of Crucible. It's too big, and it's not the point of this video. Instead, 
I'll focus on its metaphorical significance and the broader implication it holds within the game. For those of you interested in a more detailed analysis of the Crucible itself, I highly recommend Crunchy's video on the subject. It's exceptionally well done and provides a thorough exploration. Ok, so what is Crucible? From Crucible Tree Armor and Silurius Tree we learn. Hold the power of the Crucible of Life, the primordial form of the Eldry. The primordial form of the Eldry is close in nature to life itself. Furthermore, aspects of the Crucible reveals more about its nature. This is a manifestation of the Eldry's primal vital energies, an aspect of the primordial Crucible, where all life was once blended together. The Crucible was once a tree, and much like the air tree, shares similar life-giving properties. Like the crucible was the source of all life, paintings within Leandal depicts individuals growing directly from the air tree, suggesting that the air tree, like the crucible, has the power to generate life. Melanas dialogue also implies that there is another way to be born in this world. Does being born of a mother mean one behaves in such a manner? And all the lives that once inside this crucible were blended into one undistinguishable thing. In real life it is also something similar. Crucible is a container, in which metals or other substances can be heated to very high temperatures. It seems correlated. Fire metaphorically has a funny property. It can unify many things into one singular substance. If we burn several different pieces of wood, it will all become one singular ash. Same with crucible, it is used to melt different metals, and as a result we will get one singular liquid-like substance. That is why fire is so effective against scarlet rod, because they are metaphorically opposite. Rod embodies the cycle of death and rebirth. As one living organism decays, it gives rise to new life. For instance, a rotting tree becomes a host to numerous parasitic mushrooms and other fungi. Similarly, in everyday life, food in warm place will rot, becoming a breeding ground for insects and bacteria. So rot symbolizes how life can emerge from decay, where the death of one organism leads to the birth of many others. And fire is about melting many lives into one singular liquid-like crucible. Because of such properties of fire, we can recreate crucible by burning all life. Melt it all away with the yellow chaos flame until all is one again. The hollow tree guarded by crucible knight Siluria might indeed be the original crucible tree, where all life was once merged. Its hollow interior suggests it could have served as a container. And interestingly, the crucible tree set is found within this tree, supporting this theory. Another meaning of the word crucible is a trial. Crucible is used to refer to a situation in which something is tested or a conflict takes place often one which produces something new. Sounds similar? Let me jump to the conclusion. The crucible in Elden Ring metaphorically represents the process of evolution, focusing specifically on its trial aspects, the natural selection. As Tarnish archaeologist brilliantly explained in his video, this statue symbolizes the crucible and the birth of the earth tree. From a single root Many trees sprouted, but only one emerged victorious in this natural contest, eventually becoming the earth tree. The numerous roots found in the deep root depths could represent the other contenders that failed to prevail in this evolutionary challenge. Also, in another video, the Tarnish archaeologist describes how Crucible Knights once participated in the Colosseum. What further proves their relation with trials? The concept of all life blended together also perfectly fits in this metaphor. 
If we trace back along the evolutionary timeline, we see that diverse species converge to a common ancestor, regardless of the variety of present-day species. If we trace far enough back, they all share the same origin, until we get to the origin of life itself. That is what crucible means. And funny enough, evolutionary diagrams are often depicted as trees. The tree of life. The crucible. This connection between the crucible and evolution is further emphasized in items like the crucible gauntlets. In time, the strength shown by this knight, and even their appearance, was seen as chaotic and deserving of scorn. As mentioned earlier, evolution is inherently chaotic, marked by random mutations and unpredictable outcomes. Thus, the association of the crucible with chaos in Elden Ring is certainly not coincidental. Crucible Feather Talisman item also adds to this. A vestige of the crucible of primordial life, born partially of devolution. It was considered a signifier of the divine in ancient times, but is now increasingly disdained as an impurity as civilization has advanced. Civilization, of course, represents order. And it's only natural that chaos and order are fundamentally incompatible due to their opposite natures. Just as Crucible serves as a metaphor for the natural selection aspects of evolution, I theorize that omens represent the random mutations of evolution. More specifically, not just random harmless mutations, but those which bring disadvantages, the bad genes. But first lore. Who exactly are omens? Omens are defined by one of the aspects of the Crucible, horns. Any living creature can be born with the horns people, animals, and even gods, which is evident from the budding horror description. This horn began to sprout on a beast that typically bears no horn. Perhaps it's a vestige of the primordial crucible. Deer, sheep, or even lions are not safe from random ill mutations. Judging from remembrance of the Omen King, we can say for sure, Omen become Omen by birth. The very same fate occurs with misbegottens. The misbegottens are held to be a punishment for making content with the crucible, and from birth they are treated as a slave or worse. They are treated as slaves because they have crucible aspects, and since it was from birth, it is safe to assume that contact with crucible is happening during birth. Similar to how mutations are determined at the birth. These traits are then passed down through generations by your genes, your blood. There is tons of evidence in the game that omen traits are carried specifically by blood. Each time Elden Ring discusses the omen's powers of Mok and Amargot, it specifically references their blood. Mok, a cursed blood, erupted with fire. An outer god bestows power to Mok upon a cursed blood. Mok's rune is soaked in accursed blood, the accursed blood that Morgoth recanted and sealed away. Also, from War Sarajengaun, of the sergeants that were abducted by the Lord of Blood, none were able to tame the accursed blood. Mok, Lord of Blood, transplanted his cursed blood into his followers, which visibly affected them. The Albinorix, who served Mok, displays omen horns a direct consequences of carrying his blood. This confirms that they inherited his omen traits, the same random mutations found in Mog's genes. Thus, omens are indeed defined by their blood. For an easier understanding of the metaphorical meaning of omens, you can think of omen horns as diseases that creatures or humans are born with. For instance, consider Gangreen. It is potentially fatal condition that often turns the affected skin a greenish-black color. I will not include footage of real-life photos as they can be quite disturbing. I don't recommend looking this up either due to their graphic nature. It looks kinda similar to omen legs, 
However, to illustrate the point, you can observe Morgoth tooth instead. Gangrene happens when the blood flows to a large area of tissues cut off, similarly to the traits of omen. It is caused by blood. And more notably, amputation, the surgical removal of a limb, has historically been a common treatment for severe cases of gangrene to prevent the spread of infection and decay. As civilization advanced, we developed antibiotics, which offer a safer and more effective method to combat gangrene. I believe such types of diseases were the inspiration of omens. And from omen burn and regal omen burn we know that amputation was a common method to treat omens. But omen, born of reality, do not have the horns exist. Because in Elden Ring world medicine is not as advanced as in ours, parents of omens cannot afford full treatment and must resort to amputation. However, royal children born with omen traits are treated differently. They are kept underground, possibly in the hope that a cure might be found, or just to protect them. And great omen killer Cleaver specifically mentions the amputation process. The blade of this huge, loathsome cleaver comprises a row of amputated omen horns. Weapon of slaughter wielded by omen killers. The hideous horns cause blood loss. These weapons were specifically crafted as tools against omens, whose defining characteristic is their blood. Therefore, it makes sense that omen killers would use these weapons with the intention of making omens lose all their blood. Another reason to believe that omens are not inherently evil but rather afflicted can be found in performer Tricia Spirit Ashes. Tricia was once known as a healer, who dedicated her effort to treating misbegotten omen and all this seen as impure. So there were can people like Tricia trying to specifically cure this disease. However, Tricia's effort ultimately failed. This failure is understandable given the era where traditional knowledge may not suffice to address such complex conditions. Based on Blessed Dew Talisman, we can see that people were healed just by standing nearby Erdry. There was no real need for doctors during the time of Erdry. And even after the end of the Erdry, the age of the Golden Order started, which ultimately killed motivation for any medical research. People are immortal. What is the point of cure now? One more thing that is worth mentioning is that omen are omens of what? Omen means a bad sign. But to what does it refer? The Golden Order is the perfect order, the culmination of perfection itself. Everyone is immortal, everyone is eternal, nothing changed. But what if some people were just born with random mutations? That is a sign. Sign that order is not perfect after all. I already explained in detail why exactly the Golden Order hates Omen in my Laws of the Golden Order video. Evolution is a beautiful thing, really are. Our intelligence, vitality and civilization are all products of it. If evolution had stopped working millions of years ago, we'd be no different from monkeys today. So why? Why did I say that evolution is bad? Before I start the explanation, for the context, soul's law is really only considered things from a pessimistic point of view. Take for example the lore of Dark Souls, which is notably darker than that of Elden Ring. The Dark Souls. Your ancestor claimed the Dark Souls and waited for fire to subside. And soon the flames did fade and only dark remained. It features the Curse of Undead which grants human immortality by branding them with dark sign. But why is a sign that grants immortality considered a curse? Isn't that a good thing? Why not call it blessing of the undead instead? The answer, as explicitly stated in Dark Souls 2, because life itself is a curse. 
nothing good came from life, just suffering. And if the only good thing in life, death, is taken away, then existence becomes an eternal curse. And also, in the interview with IGN, Miyazaki personally talked about it. Personally, a world that is happy and bright is something that just doesn't feel realistic to me. It may sound like I have a trauma or something, but I believe that the world is generally a wasteland that is not kind to us. That's just the way I see it. Back to the main topic. As I described, evolution is inherently aimless, lacking purpose, consciousness or direction. It is chaos on its purest form. It operates on the principle of natural selection where only the strongest survive. Now, imagine if species on Earth progressed so far that competition became unnecessary. What if their medical knowledge advanced to a point where even weaker individuals could survive and have children? In such scenario, natural selection would cease to function. No, really. Natural selection no longer plays the same role in modern human society as it once did. Today, virtually everyone has the potential to survive and reproduce, regardless of genetic disadvantages. Consider the scenario of a blind man born 5000 years ago. Chances are, he might have died young. Fast forward to the present day. And the same individual could simply just put the glasses on and nothing will be wrong. He could live a normal life. And I think this is the beautiful thing. I really do. But there is an obvious downside to this. People with illnesses, with bad eyesight, with weak legs, with weak immune systems just can live a normal life. But these people will have children, and their children will have more children, spreading the bad genes over humanity. Hundreds will be reborn cursed and they'll bear thousands of cursed children, who bear tens of thousands more. The stronger our medical knowledge, the worse genes will be passed to the next generations. Crucible Feather Talisman further emphasizes these points. It is a vestige of the Crucible of Primordial Life. It was considered divine in ancient times, but now it is symbol of impurity, as civilization has advanced. Crucible as chaos, was considered divine when civilization, which is order, was not developed enough. This reflects the problematic nature of evolution. Over time, it can lead to a weakening of the population. Evidence of this is found in the giant crusher description. This weapon was all but forgotten. Man has grown feeble in comparison to his four beers. Present people are unable to wield this hammer they have grown weaker compared to their ancestor. This theme of diminishing strength across generations is a recurring motif in every Souls game. For instance, in Sekiro, Genichiro is portrayed as inferior to his grandfather Ishin, the Sword Saint. In Dark Souls 1, dragons were immortal beings who saw the future and lived even when the concept of life did not exist. But what evolution did to these godly creatures? They've evolved into vibrants, and they've evolved into drakes. Once strong and noble, and now just a pathetic beings. Dragons from Elden Ring met a similar fate. But not just dragons. Look at ancient giant corpses. They were several times bigger than even fire giant, but they evolved. They become smaller. And their successors, trolls, even smaller. From Sword of Milos, we learn that some modern giants were even human-sized. Godfrey is the Giga Chat itself. He led the Crucible Knights, the winner of natural selection, the culmination of evolution. But what about his legacy? Godric, the distant relative of him, is just pathetic. On 
the state gun drinks nothing more than a jumped up country bumpkin. Lord, oh, don't make me laugh. He had an ugly heart, an uglier countenance, and met the ugliest of ends, eh? <laughs> Nefeli also seemed to have his blood, but she was clearly nowhere near his strength or size. I can continue this list, but I think you got the point. To summarize, the inherent problem of evolution is that natural selection is not working when civilization is developed enough due to our environment which bears no danger. And because of that, people will become weaker over a long time. But there is a hope. In the second part, I will present three different solutions how to overcome this problem. And one of them is about Dan Kitter. I am mostly finished with it, it will be released next week. Subscribe to not miss it. Yeah, really, please subscribe. <laughs> I hope you like this video. I left out a lot of information for simplicity. I didn't say anything about the huge connection between Red and Crucible, about Godskins, about Spirals and Crucible, or a little about Misbegottens. And that wasn't the point, I tried to focus on uh, metaphorical meanings. I really hope the video was not boring. But do not fear, the second part will be more interesting in my opinion. Thank you for watching. To the next week. <laughs>